Congressman Tim Burchett's on the line with us. He is a, uh, a good man and, and represents a pretty darn good state up in Washington, D.C. He fights the good fight, and it's always good to catch up with Tim to find out what's going on in the halls of Congress. Hello, Congressman. How are you? I am well, brother. I am well. I'm in the uh, free state of Tennessee right now, so I'm doing a heck of a lot better than some folks. Well, that's pretty nice. I mean, it's good to be back in Tennessee. When uh, when do you guys go back to work in Congress? Are you there yet or what? What's the deal? Yeah, well, Monday, um, next Monday, where we it's uh, a work week back in the district. I actually get more done back in the district than I do in Washington, believe it or not. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a give and take thing. It's supposed to be half, half and half. Um, I guess the citizens legislature back in the day, that was not the way it was. It was just, you, you go up, you plant your crops, you go up there and you come home and harvest the crops. And I, they've kind of gotten a long way from that, but I think it's good for people to be home and hear the, uh, angry, how angry folks are about things like immigration and, and our incredible debt and, and our lame excuses for not doing anything about it. You know, I just, um, I, I'm kind of down. I'm kind of despondent uh, with regard to where we are as a country. Um, and, and I'm trying to remain hopeful. I'm naturally a pessimist, Tim, and I have to overcome it. Uh, I have to believe that there are good people like yourself, enough good people like yourself, elected by good people like myself and others uh, that are going to turn this huge ship of state around and get us back to a, a semblance of physical responsibility and and border security and these types of things. And and sometimes I just kind of shake my head and, and wonder if that's going to happen. I know that this has to occur to you from time to time. How do you keep a positive attitude? Well, sometimes I don't. I just pray. And I, I was telling somebody in my office this morning, I think about my dad, 20, 21 years old, on a little island called Peleliu in the South Pacific in the United States Marine Corps, supposed to be a three or four day mop up. And you know anything about that battle? It was one of the bloodiest battles of the entire war, Europe and the Pacific. And, and after that, he went to Okinawa, you know, and I think just how tough it was for him, 120 degrees and you know, bodies that would literally dead bodies of the enemies and your, and your, your friends that are shot and bloated and popping because of the heat and getting shot at by the Japanese and just how awful they were. And, um, and I'm thinking, you know, we got, it's worth fighting for. They laid down a heck of a lot more than a little dissatisfaction. And, and frankly, it's our own fault, you know, 20, 20 to 30 million so-called evangelical Christians or conservatives decided to stay home on election day. And because they didn't think their vote mattered and, and guess what it did. And we've got a, and everybody's complaining. And I know folks are going to say, well, they're going to steal it from us. Well, let's put enough points on the board so they can't steal it. And we got to get fired up. We got an election. We got to, we got to elect a president and we got to elect a Congress and a Senate because it's not going to do it president any good. Um, if, if the first vote is the Democrats control Congress and try to impeach him. And so I think we need to, we need to buckle down and do what we need to do and let's save our country. Do you like me? I hear a lot of people talking about election security, especially considering what happened in 2020. Do you like me believe that we need to at least consider a standard set of rules for presidential elections? I mean, I'm so I'm such a federalist when it comes to the state's ability to determine their own fate. I'm. I'm such a federalist to Tim that I believe that we should repeal. Hey, Matt, the- he actually dropped off and just called back. Oh, oh, and, and okay, Tim, you there? Oh, do I have I'm to? Here. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. So let me let me kind of reset this. So we we talk about um, election security and the sanctity of the vote, and I'm a federalist when it comes to um, when it comes to the state's right to determine how they're going to execute the manner of their elections. But I think the presidential election is a little bit different thing. And I've been promoting the idea of requiring a certain set of rules for all 50 states with regard to presidential elections. I'm loath to do that, Tim, because I don't want to take any authority away from the states. I mean, I'm such a federalist, I believe, in the repeal of the 17th Amendment. Uh, I, I think that our state legislatures should be appointing senators. I think that that would give the states better representation and it would decrease the influence of the federal government. That said... 
Do you think we should standardize the procedures when it comes to presidential elections to prevent some of this fraud in leftist states? I think it, it would be a wise decision. I don't know if we could get it done or not because I'm a big believer in states' rights. But the problem you have, of course, now, 20 million or 20 million, 10 million people in the last three years have come over our borders illegally. And they're going to be a lot of those folks are going to be attempting to voting, vote. And you say, well, how are they going to vote? And I say, well, mail in ballots. That's the that's going to be uh, I would <clears throat> I'd like to see us go back to all paper and just hand count them. Just watch how they do it. And just if it takes all night. It takes all night. But we're going to have to get back to that something, some form of trust in our in our balloting procedure. And the other side doesn't want to do that because they're stealing elections. And that's just the bottom line. And we got to get get to some kind of normalization in this. And to think that you can't, you got to show an ID to buy that gum six pack of beer, and you don't have to show an ID to to vote. Uh, you know, the most sacred thing we have is a country. And just you know, I have to show an ID every time I fly. I'm a United States congressman, but I, I'm you know it's just I understand it's part of the rules. But yet to vote in a lot of places you don't. We. That's a, we see other parts of the world kind of turning it around. I've been watching Javier Malay in Argentina. I yep. saw his speech before the World Economic Forum. Yet Argentina had to, well, they had two things going for them. One, that they had to hit rock bottom in order to recognize the era of their ways with regard to socialism. Two, they had nations that were trying to help them along, like the United States of America. I'm sadly starting to believe, and I... And I've gone through some depression about this lately, Tim. I'm starting to believe that we are an addict. We're addicted to spending money that we don't have. And it's going to take hitting rock bottom for us to realize the era of our ways. Sad as it is to say, even with smart people like you, you know, you're ringing the bell. You're, you're, you're sounding the alarm, but not enough people in D.C., including some fellow Republicans, seem to be listening. Yeah, well, the problem is... As you stated, uh, fellow Republicans, we're in the majority right now. We've got to stand up. You've got a few that are just so, so far to the left. And I mean, that's how they, that's the only way they can get elected in their districts. But we've got to, we got to start taking some tough stands. And I'm with you. I, uh, the spending is out of control. We're 34 trillion, 35 trillion in debt. And it just, it just never ends. And it's just, one more special project. Let's do this until we get through the next election cycle. We've been through this many times. It just never changes. Explain to me what just happened with the continuing resolution. How did that occur? Well, the um, uh, the deal was cut. There weren't enough Republicans to um, there weren't enough Republicans that were on board and. And frankly, we, they just folded because it's, I guess they're afraid to shut the government down this close to, this close to an election, but I'm not afraid to. Reagan shut the government down eight times and nobody talks about him doing that. It's, it's, I think it's that important. I think the border is that important. 10 million people, uh, close to $400 billion a year to keep those people, um, alive. And here we are Americans doing without veterans kicked out of, out of homes, out of, out of housing facilities, school kids sent home so they can, so they can house folks that are here illegal, have no, no shape, form, or fashion of any, um, any semblance of being able to support themselves. And yet we just keep doing it. And at some point we've got to say enough is enough and we got to take a stand and we just got to start electing people with guts. How long, how long did this latest deal fund the government until? Uh, I believe till March. I believe is the uh, is what they're telling me. But I, you know, help help me help me believe that we're not going to just do the same thing in March that we did the other day and that we did in December. I mean, it just it, well, the speaker, the, our new speaker said, "Trust me," and that's all we got to go on because in the past we haven't we haven't been able to trust the speaker, and that's where we got ourselves into this mess, and and it will continue down that road. I mean, I don't, you know, I. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I can't stand it. I'm so sick of it because we just, you know, they didn't come around and ask me how I was going to vote because that gum they knew. They knew. And I, you know, because I've told them many times, but this one's it. 
if we don't pull it this time, it's going to, we will implode um, in Washington, I believe. I don't believe there'll be enough. I believe you'll see uh, probably another, uh, have a new speaker, which I'm not sure that I would support. I think we need to, the, the conservatives, you know, the, the, the organizations that, that support these folks and support us need to, need to circle around this new speaker and, and, and frankly start making some demands, telling him what we need to see and what is the plan. Because if it's, if we're going to continue down the same road, it's just we're going to end up with the same conclusion, just spending more money. And, and frankly, I mean, to be honest with you, I say frankly a lot, but to be honest with you, that's what most Republicans, they don't, they don't want to see a shutdown. They want to see a continuation because they get their little pet project. You got these chairmen, um, some of the old timey chairmen, not much, none of the new ones. Mark Green's a good chairman, but it, it doesn't, this isn't him, but some of them literally, you know, they're, they have family members that are employed through some of this, these programs. And, um, and, and, you know, it just, it just keeps going on and on and on and it will never end until America starts saying enough is enough and quits voting for these people. I don't care if you play golf with them or you go to church with them. You better, you better start voting like your country depends on it. Cause that I mean, it does this time. It's for all the marbles. Tim Burchett with us. He's serving in the second congressional district here in the state of Tennessee, uh, talking with him about the ongoing issues involving spending in Washington, D.C. You mentioned Mike Johnson expressed to the Republicans on your side of the aisle to trust him. I don't distrust Johnson, but I feel like I've been around the block a time or two with regard to how this works. Why do I feel like it is as as plain as the nose on my face that in March they're going to come to an impasse and Republicans are going to demand that we kick the can down the road beyond the election cycle like they always do. They always do this, Tim. And and I know that I if I'm accused of anything rightly so, it's uh, it's yelling at people who agree completely with me on these points because you're the only ones that I can get to talk about it. But I mean, I've been around the block a time or two to know that this is what happens. They're, they're going to get to March. They're not going to get what they want. And instead of shutting the government down to demand what they want, they're going to try to kick it past the election. I, I'm not going to argue with you on any points you've made. I, I thoroughly, I mean, that's why I've not voted for any of these things. <laughs> I know. And that's what's so frustrating about all of it because I, I tell them that's what they're going to do. And, you know, and until, I, I don't know what it's going to take. Is it going to take gas to go back up to five dollars a gallon, and and inflation continue just to march out of control? Or are we going to say enough is enough? You know, we it, it's just amazing to me all these wars we've been getting into, and how the left is is pushing these wars and telling us they're sending these economists to us and saying, "Oh, but you don't understand. Half the money is spent on." you know, like missile defense systems and things in this country, and it's providing jobs, you know, $114 billion. I said, well, then why don't you just pay, uh, you know, why don't you just split that down the middle and just write that check to these these war defense companies and just and just call it a day because that's exactly their reasoning. And it, it, it's just, it's false economics. And these kids are coming and, you know, these advisors on all this stuff are coming from our colleges and universities. And we, we've got to just stop. We've got to stop. We've got to say no. And we just can't keep going down this road. And I, I wish more people would join with me in Congress, but it's very difficult. Uh, on, because- the, uh, on the specific issue, before I have to say goodbye to you, I want to address this southern border issue, which I believe it, it, it is if there are two existential threats, the long-term threat being the debt, the short-term threat is our poor southern border and the millions of people who are flooding illegally into the United States of America, diluting our votes as citizens uh, in the process. The courts just recently decided that Texas, at least temporarily, cannot prevent the federal government from cutting some of their razor wire. I think that's a side issue to the overall problem that the federal government, in the form of the executive branch, is not doing its constitutional responsibility. It's not doing what the Congress has demanded of it, they claim it's because you guys haven't funded them enough. That's what I hear from Corinne Jean-Pierre and, you know, Jake Saul, whoever, Alejandro Mayorkas, whoever is running the government. It's not Joe Biden. Uh, what's your response to that as a member of Congress? Have you funded 
appropriately uh, our border patrol in a way that you believe they could shut the border down if they chose to? All we have to do is enforce the laws, and we're not allowing her. We're just tying the hands. It's it's not. I heard uh, Biden say, "I just need more money." I've been saying there's a problem for ten years. I mean, he's a pathological liar if he actually believes that. He it just it, it's just not true. It's not amount of money to this Washington will fix this problem. You've got to build a wall. There's no it, listen. You got a boat that's taken on water, and there's some people that want to bail. That some there's some people that want to plug the leak, and there's some people that want to panic. I think it's two part. I think you plug the hole, and then you start bailing. You start exporting these people that are here illegally that have come here in the last um, last three years. And granted, that's eight to ten million people, but it's once you start, they're gonna they're gonna uh, they're gonna buckle down. They'll start getting out, or they'll start becoming productive members of society and not drawing attention to themselves. So, you know, it, it just can't. It can't continue. They're lying. They've done the polling. 85% of Americans, you know, now it's going to be, you know, see all these Democrats putting these proposals together. But all their proposals, you know, we've already done H.R. 2. We sent it to the Senate. That that should be the model. Send, if they don't like it, modify it, amend it, send it back. But they won't. They won't address it. Their solution, more money, more lawyers, more judges. Listen, just uh, Trump stay in Mexico work. And, and our national chambers of commerce are to blame for most of this. They want the cheap labor. They want people cleaning our motel rooms. They want people mowing our yards. They want people fixing our roofs that they don't have to insure. They want to take advantage of these people, take advantage of the situation. They're, they're all for America when America's doing great. They're waving the flag. But when it's going bad, guess what? The rest of us are selling, and they're buying at bargain basement prices. And it's, it's, I'd say it's portfolio over people. And that's exactly what's going on with this border. Congressman, continue to fight the good fight. Hey, congratulations on being named one of the top defenders of liberty. I saw your scorecard there from the Liberty Caucus. Good news, right? Yes, sir. I'm always glad to do it. I noticed uh, uh, somebody, uh, one of my future opponents is doing a push poll calling me a, um, uh, a tax and spend liberal. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm sorry. Good luck on that. I don't mean uh, that. Well, I don't I don't mean to giggle, but if if you're a tax and spend liberal, you know, we might as well turn out the lights and call it a call it a country. I mean, that's yeah, that's but that's all they got. That's that's McCarthy and some of his people. They're just it's um it's very unfortunate, but that's just what we're up against. And that's that's why, you know, we a lot of these wealthy people gave Kevin McCarthy a, a heck of a lot of money to fight Democrats. And you know what he did? He fought Republicans. He fought conservative Republicans and, and to elect, try to elect these moderates. And that's why we're in such bad shape we are because of our former leadership. And you don't see that with Mike Johnson. He's straight up. He might not vote like we like, but he's a straight up guy and he's not lying to us. Well, the audience wants me to tell you how much we love and appreciate you, Tim. I thank you for what you're doing in D.C. I appreciate your time. Uh, you're always available when we call. And, uh, and thank you for everything you do in D.C. Tell tell all your folks to do two things. Vote on Election Day and pray for our country. Amen, brother. Take care. Thank you. Here's Congressman Tim Burchett.